This month, we're going to be looking at the nature of faith and examining what goes into the process of believing when we don't know everything. In our day and age, it can be hard to believe anything. Just ask Abraham Lincoln. (laughs) Wise insight from our 16th president. Don't believe everything you read on the internet just because there's a picture with a quote next to it. Abraham Lincoln. There's all kinds of that out there. Information that we can't trust. You'd think that people would be skeptical, but instead, I think people are willing to believe anything that sounds interesting. Like this. I've seen this on Facebook probably 30 times. The whole world is the same age today. It happens only once every 1,000 years. Your age plus your year of birth, every person is 2018. It's so strange that even Chinese and foreign experts can't, I don't know why they say Chinese, can't explain it. You figure it out and see if it's 2018. It's a thousand year wait, but your age minus your year of birth is always going to be the year that you're in. I guess if your birthday hasn't happened yet this year, then that might be different. But this, this is always true. But people have shared this as if it's an amazing thing on a specific day that happens. People that, that are college professors that I know um, have, have done that. If it's exciting, if it seems interesting, we're willing to believe it and think that it needs to be disseminated out into the world. Now these are just funny examples. We live in a world in which people, on the one hand, are getting more skeptical, and on the other hand, I think are becoming more gullible. People are getting more skeptical and more gullible at the same time. Now how can that be? Well, I don't want to get into politics, but our political climate is an example of how we are set up to see the world in terms of duality. Yes and no. Black and white. Agree, disagree. Left and right. I didn't mean for that to rhyme. But we live in an age of abundant information. And we are so inundated with information that in order to process it, it's almost as if we have to put it in one box or another just for the sake of simplicity. Like a computer, where a processor processes things as a one or a zero so that it can make decisions quickly and process the information. We're working almost in the same way. There's so much information out there that our brains have to, can't process it all, and we have to shorten the time it takes somehow to think about things before new information comes in. So we try to classify the way that we see the world as quickly as we can, and it's easiest to do that if there's only two boxes to put things in. But when we do that, we become both skeptical and gullible. Skeptical when information doesn't fit into a certain box. Gullible when we think it does, or when we want it to. But even when we try to give ourselves a spectrum of options, it doesn't always help. Take surveys and polls, for example. A number of you have been kind enough to to fill out the survey that uh, I put on Facebook and that we've uh, linked in, I don't know if it's in the bulletin, but I know in the newsletter. And I had one where you have a range of responses, not relevant to extremely relevant. Um, But even, I, I took a public opinion class in college, and even those can be just as distorting or just as problematic as a yes or no answer. So let's say you have a range of answers one to five. There's actually a name for for that kind of survey question. It's a Likert scale where you have strongly disagree, disagree, undecided, agree, strongly agree. Now, if it's a question that sometimes people, maybe one side is is fiercely uh, motivated by and the other side is just kind of meh. So you, say you have 30 people who strongly disagree, and you have 30 people who agree, but not strongly. Then if you average everything out, you're actually going to end up with a little bit on the side of disagree, just because some people feel more strongly. But oftentimes, it's the people who have researched something the most 
and develop the most nuanced opinions that are not willing to go to the extreme when answering questions. So even the point is when, even you, when you even have try to get a range of responses rather than just one or the other, you can actually cause more problems when you're trying to classify things in your head, get responses from people, process information. Because as soon as you open yourself up to a whole scale, you have to figure out how to, to compare things on that scale. Anyway, the point of all this is that we live in a world where somehow we're both skeptical and gullible, where we have all kinds of information, but also one where we want answers. And we want answers to be as definitive as possible. But we also try to live lives of faith. And that means we don't know everything in God's plan. We don't fully know God's purposes as they are right in front of us in our days. When it comes to God, we can't always have the definitive answers. The answers that we can easily categorize like we might want them to be. We want to know things. But because we don't always know things, we can be faced with doubt. So when we end up in a situation in life where we want to have faith, that might also be a situation in which we have the most uncertainty. But that's part and parcel of having faith. And in Scripture, there are a lot of cases that have the interplay of doubt and faith. But there's one particular verse that puts this dilemma especially succinctly, and that's Mark 9, verse 24. A man brings his child to Jesus and asks Jesus to heal him. Jesus says, all things are possible to one who believes. And the man says, I believe, help my unbelief. I believe, help my unbelief. What does that even mean? Well, it could be that the man is asking, asking Jesus to prove himself as if maybe he wanted to see a miracle and he's telling Jesus, hey, if you're really a miracle worker, then prove it. But Jesus probably would have been more resistant to that. Now, in order to get a better grasp on this comment, on this man's comment, Jesus gave him the benefit of the doubt. Let's look at everything going on in this passage. It's Mark 9, 14-29. And I'm going to read it once through before going through it piece by piece. Let's start with prayer. Heavenly Father, open our ears and our hearts and our minds so we may perceive Your work, so that we may grow in trust and in faith, so that we may not fear the unknown, but rest in Your providence and Your purpose. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. And when they came to the disciples, Jesus, Peter, James, and John had just been on a mountaintop in which the voice of God the Father had said, this is my son. They came down the mountain. They saw a great crowd around them and scribes arguing with them. And immediately all the crowd, when they saw him, were greatly amazed and ran up to him and greeted him. And he asked them, what are you arguing about with them? And someone from the crowd answered him, Teacher, I brought my son to you, for he has a spirit that makes him mute. And whenever it seizes him, it throws him down, and he foams and grinds his teeth and becomes rigid. So I asked your disciples to cast it out, and they were not able. And Jesus answered them, O faithless generation, how long am I to be with you? How long am I to bear with you? Bring him to me. And they brought the boy to him. And when the spirit saw him, immediately it convulsed the boy. And he fell on the ground and rolled about, foaming at the mouth. And Jesus asked his father, how long has this been happening to him? And he said, from childhood. And it has often cast him into fire and into water to destroy him. But if you can do anything, have compassion on us and help us. And Jesus said to him, if you can, all things are possible for one who believes. Immediately the father of the child cried out and said, I believe. Help my unbelief. And when Jesus saw that a crowd came running together, He rebuked the unclean spirit, saying to it, You mute and deaf spirit, I command you, come out of him and never enter him again. 
And after crying out and convulsing him terribly, it came out. And the boy was like a corpse. So the most of them said, He is dead. But Jesus took him by the hand and lifted him up, and he arose. And when he had entered the house, his disciples asked him privately, Why could we not cast it out? And he said to them, This kind cannot be driven out by anything but prayer. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Verse 14 tells us, And when they came to the disciples, they saw a great crowd around them and scribes arguing with them. So the passage starts with a scene. Right before this, Jesus, Peter, James, and John had been on the mountaintop. They came down. They found the other disciples in an argument with some scribes. Now the scribes were the top level of religious scholars. They were charged with writing things down and doing it correctly. And the disciples, well, the disciples were not thought of as the top level of scholars, but the disciples did know Jesus. They had learned from Him. So they were repeating His positions, His arguments. The way that Jewish scholars were taught in those days was that a rabbi would select a group of promising young students. Sometimes maybe just one, but often a few. And usually he would pick them, uh, maybe the most brilliant 13-year-old young men, boys. And they would follow him, and, and he would teach. And the style of teaching was to ask questions, and then to answer questions with other questions, to lead people along. So debating was just what they would do during the day. They would debate. Our translations of the Bible say that the disciples were arguing with the scribes, but that doesn't necessarily mean a heated argument. It's just kind of what they did. The Greek word is su zeteo. Su means along with. Zeteo means to seek. It literally means they were seeking together. The scribes knew about God as their rabbis had told them, and the disciples knew about God through the way that Jesus had taught them. But when Jesus arrived, the attention of all these debaters in the crowd turned to Him. If there was something questionable in what the disciples were saying, Jesus could answer because He was their rabbi. But I don't want to under, understate, even though this is probably a fairly friendly argument here, I don't want to understate how tense the environment still would have been. Even if they were debating politely, Jesus had already spoken ill of King Herod and of the Pharisees. The Pharisees were kind of like the scribes, but with political power. Um, I guess if the scribes were experts in the law, then the Pharisees were the lawyers who weren't quite as good at law, so they went to, to be politicians. That was the Pharisees. Um, this is the only congregation in the world that doesn't have a lawyer in it, so I can, I can say these kinds of things. <laughs> Right? I think. At least that's what I've been told. And if you are a lawyer, we need you on session to help us whenever we have a question, so let me know if you are, or if you're hiding it. Don't hide it after I just said that. Now the scribes, the scribes dealt in certainty. If you want to talk, to, talk about people who think they know everything and can back it up, the scribes were those people. They had an answer to every question and a question to every answer. It was their job to be pretty darn certain about the law. From the perspective of the people in the crowd, and this is important, from the people's perspective, the scribes were at the pinnacle of knowledge and faith. They knew everything. So the people in the crowd were witnessing one of the most exciting spectacles that they could have been witnessing. Outside of maybe like a gladiator battle or something like that, a debate between scribes and sort of an off-the-wall rabbi's disciples would have been great entertainment for people in, in a little town. Kind of like maybe, I don't know, it's like if Alabama came and played Presbyterian College or something like that. Or Clemson came and play, went and played you know, nearby. So. Um, but yeah, the biggest, the biggest show in town. Then immediately all the crowd who was watching this show, when Jesus showed up, were greatly amazed and ran up to him and greeted him. And he asked them, what are you arguing about with them? 
And Jesus was curious too. Jesus wanted to know. He probably realized what they were arguing about, but he wanted someone to put it in their own words. He asked the people what the debate was over. But then the man, the man who had probably started the debate by bringing his child to them, answered and said, Teacher, I brought my son to you, for he has a spirit that makes him mute. And you start to think, oh, that's not bad. The kid can't talk back. But then verse 18, whenever it seizes him, it throws him down, and he foams and grinds his teeth and becomes rigid. So that is pretty bad. So I asked your disciples to cast it out, and they were not able. The man wanted a demon to be cast out, but he addressed Jesus as teacher, respecting the, the, the educational kind of format of what was going on. He had asked the disciples to cast it out, and that's probably how they got into a debate with the scribes. The disciples had seen Jesus do this sort of thing, so they knew it was possible but it wasn't really something in the normal realm of what the scribes would have been doing. The tendency back then was for these sorts of things, a boy with this kind of spirit, to be treated as a matter of cleanliness, a matter of sin, or just a matter of having an evil spirit. Today, we might classify someone with these symptoms as, uh, as having mental illness, or maybe a chemical imbalance, or something like that. Because we think, we think in terms of health and science and the ability to, to explain things in, in rational ways. But back then, they thought in terms of cleanliness and sin and, and sacrifice. So dealing with a child with these symptoms would have been a matter of going through the right religious procedures for the scribes. So the disciples may have been arguing that the demon could be cast out because they had seen Jesus do it. And the scribes would probably have been emphasizing the need to go through certain rituals according to the law to see if the demon could be cast out, if the scribes even believed that it was possible. In other words, the disciples probably knew a pretty good bit about the law and scriptures, but they were arguing based on what they had seen done. The scribes were arguing based on what they had known and what they had researched. The disciples were confident in their experience, and the scribes were confident in their knowledge. Now, this doesn't make a perfect parallel with current events, but in general, the way we process things in the world and argue them, I mean, do we have any recent examples of, of one side arguing that someone's personal truth is a matter of experience, and the other side arguing that truth is a matter of investigation and acquiring knowledge? Has anything like that happened in the last week or so? Well, neither the scribes nor the disciples could get this taken care of. So the man came and Jesus heard his problem. And I love Jesus' response. And he answered them, O oh, faithless generation, how long am I to be with you? How long am I to bear with you? Bring him to me. Jesus calls everyone there faithless. But were they really faithless? Everyone there was a committed religious person. They just had different understandings of how things could work. So maybe they weren't faithless in the sense that they had no faith or no belief, but faithless in that they had no perspective. Jesus asked, how long will I be with you? See, it wasn't enough for Jesus just to, to know that he was going to be dying for their sins, for our sins. Jesus was thinking more than just in terms of sacrifice. He was thinking in terms of the way people understand him or don't even understand him. These folks, whether they were the disciples, whether they were the, the scribes, whether they were basing things on experience or they were basing things on, on knowledge and learning, they were both still seeing the world in terms of what provides enough certainty, what provides enough power for miracles. The experience, the knowledge, what does it? 
when Jesus was right in front of them and He was the answer. In this moment, He wonders how long He's going to be with them because they're still tethered to their ways of perceiving the world, their ways of perceiving God. And in this argument, the disciples are basically playing on the scribes' ball field. The disciples had been with Jesus. They believed the things He was doing. They still saw the world in terms of the way that the scribes wanted to figure things out. The disciples knew Jesus, but they still kind of let the scribes make the rules for the debate. And the scribes' rules did not make room for Jesus. The scribes' way of seeing the world did not make room for the Savior. You know, there's a saying, don't wrestle with a pig because you both get covered in slop and the pig likes it. How often do we run into that out in the world? We try to interact with people on their own terms, but their terms make it impossible to get anywhere with them. Maybe we're those people sometimes. The scribes didn't even consider that Jesus might be the Son of God, so there was no chance of the disciples convincing them. But still, the disciples were debating them and not recognizing the spiritual power of the matter at play in Jesus. Their arguments were directed to the issues they were facing with their opponents. Meanwhile, the real issue, the real problem, was that a man was desperate for someone to heal his boy. He realized that all of the debating was not doing him any good. So he went straight to Jesus. And they brought the boy to him. And when the Spirit saw him, immediately it convulsed the boy. And he fell on the ground and rolled about, foaming at the mouth. Interestingly, the Spirit, the one being in this passage who recognizes where the true power is, is the Spirit. When confronted with Jesus, convulsed the boy. This isn't the first time this has happened. Earlier in Mark, Mark 4, when Jesus heals the demoniac, at, uh, uh, the, the Gerasene demoniac, the Spirit actually says, I know who you are, Son of the Most High God. The spirits are living in the realm where the true power is known. So when confronted with Jesus, it convulsed the boy. And Jesus asked the father, how long has this been happening to him? And he said, from childhood. And it's often cast him into fire and into water to destroy him. But if you can do anything, have compassion on us and help us. And Jesus has... This boy's rolling on the ground, convulsing and foaming at the mouth. And Jesus actually has a very basic and observational question. He doesn't show any drama. He says, how long has this been happening to him? Shows that it's not an act. That Jesus is not just, just making a show of things. But is really considering the pain that the boy and the father have been through. But also lets everyone else know what the father was dealing with, spending his life trying to rescue his son. If the spirit had been throwing the boy into, into fire and water, how many times has this man had to go in and rescue his child? His life had to be rearranged around his child's condition. With a son unable to communicate, and no religious experts could fix the problem. Nevertheless, the man has the faith to come to Jesus and ask for Jesus' compassion. Now, I found out early on in my time here that y'all mostly know the word for compassion because my predecessor, Bob Fuller, was a big fan of it. Do you remember the word? Thank you. Splangnizomai. So, splangnizomai is the Greek word for compassion. And it actually means a churning of the guts. But the English word compassion is also important Calm passion. Calm pathos. Jesus suffers with. Calm with pathos. Angst, suffering. Jesus suffers with. The man had seen his own son suffering for years. And Jesus sees his own children around him trying to figure out what's going on here in this crowd. Suffering from ignorance and apprehension 
and skepticism. Even here, Jesus was taking on their suffering and seeing its worst effects. And Jesus said to him, If you can, all things are possible for one who believes. Immediately, the father of the child cried out and said, I believe. Help my unbelief. So what does that mean? Well, Jesus had just made two statements challenging the people's belief. He had said, O oh, faithless generation, and he had said, if you believe, anything is possible for one who believes. So the man's responding to that a little bit. But also, this was a man whose entire time outside of any kind of work was probably taken up by this afflicted child. He didn't have time to follow a rabbi around all day and learn. Didn't have time to study like the scribes. But he had time to deal with the suffering that was before him and wonder where God was in it. And after listening to these debates of these scholars and these disciples all day long, he took his, he took his son to town to try to get him healed and he ended up listening to a debate. It could have been easy to come away from that thinking that he just didn't have enough faith. Or he didn't believe the right way. Or he didn't believe the right things. Even though he had some faith in God, he was surrounded by incapable experts that only made him feel less adequate. His doubts were not about Jesus. Rather, his doubts were about his ability to understand, to see, to know. More than anyone else there, he recognized that God was powerful and capable, but that he could not make sense of the world. He had lived with that heartbreaking realization since his son was a child, that he could not make sense of the suffering. So he could have easily thought that he did not have enough faith when he said, I believe, help my unbelief. But with faith, it's not always about how much. Sometimes it's about what kind. What kind of faith. What kind of belief. If it's a faith that tries to have everything explained and accounted for, at some point you run into the unknown. And then does your anxiety take over? Is it a doubt to try to explain everything? Does too much explanation border on mythology? If you try to explain everything, you start running into explanations that don't need to be there or that God might not have wanted to be there. We all have differing levels of this kind of faith, and that is part of faith, wanting to know, wanting to understand. Now, when faced with a crisis, some of us are content to just leave it up to God. And some of us want to know every detail and do everything that we can when we're faced with a crisis so we know that we have done everything on our level that can be done. Between those two ends of the spectrum, there's not necessarily a right or a wrong, but the real issue is what do we do when we don't know, when we can't know? What do we do with our failures and our inabilities? What do we do with our doubts? At some point on that line, we have to be okay with not knowing, not understanding. Maybe not even fully believing the extent of God's power and purpose, but believing that He has one, that He has a purpose, and that He is at work. What this man referred to as, as his unbelief was in many ways simply the faith of one who does not know, but who trusts. Doubt can still have trust. Even in the darkest moments and the darkest times, trust can overcome so much doubt, can overcome all kinds of skepticism and fear. This man may, have not, may not have had all the answers but he had enough trust to go to Jesus and say, I believe, help my unbelief. Trust is the sort of faith that answers doubt. And it's easy to give lip service to that 
But it's true. And it helps to practice it, to acknowledge our powerlessness and accept Jesus' power, which He showed here. And when Jesus saw that a crowd came running together, He rebuked the unclean spirit, saying to it, You mute and deaf spirit. He's talking to a deaf spirit. You mute and deaf spirit. I command you, come out of Him and never enter Him again. And even though it's a deaf spirit, apparently it heard. And after crying out and convulsing Him terribly, it came out and the boy was like a corpse. So the most of them said, He's dead. Jesus' power had brought the crowd together. A crowd that would have only watched this child from a distance normally, but who came to watch as He was healed. A crowd that had been looking for a good debate was treated to a miracle. And perhaps more importantly, a restoration of a son, a father, a family. But the people who were there, they could only see by observation and not by faith, thought the boy was dead. Now if Jesus was setting out to heal a boy, why, if he was casting out a demon, why would he kill the boy? Why would he let the boy die as well? But that's what people thought because that's all that they could see. And Jesus was right. They were a faithless generation, only believing what they saw right in front of them. Only measuring the importance of something by the anxiety and urgency of the moment that was. Not recognizing that any time a change happens, there has to be a, some zero point where there's nothing in order to come back. A turning point. That's basic physics. Y'all are a very scientifically oriented congregation. You know, lots of engineers. So. Anytime a change has to happen and growth has to happen, there has to be a zero point, a point of no momentum from which it comes back. And even when we feel like we might be at that point, the trust that God has a purpose is way more important than any of our abilities to process the situation. Jesus touched the boy and then helped him up. An act of love and grace just as powerful as his act of healing. And when he had entered the house, his disciples asked, his disciples asked, asked him privately, why could we not cast it out? And he said to them, this kind cannot be driven out by anything but prayer. Prayer. If there's one act that demonstrates God's power and our powerlessness, it's the act of prayer. It's an act that we often forget when we spend our lives of faith trying to figure things out and rationalize them. And that we might inadvertently set aside if we are too confident or complacent. But it's also a practice that says, I believe, help my unbelief. Doubt is abundantly present in our world. But doubt itself is not necessarily the problem because doubt comes from inability, from ignorance, or the simple truth that we cannot do and we cannot know everything we want to have possible and have known. But when there is doubt, do we also have trust? And we can trust. And if we have trouble trusting, there's also a way we can build that trust, and that is through prayer. Now, of course, we can build that trust as well by sharing in the faith with one another, in study, and in fellowship, uh, in worship, and, and in our own efforts to know more. But if we want to throw our trust upon God and say, I believe, help my unbelief, prayer is the invitation to that. Even as we're about to take communion together, we acknowledge that there is the mystery of God's work, the Holy Spirit's work in bringing us together and sharing this meal in the sacrifice of Jesus who offered His life for us. Today is also World Communion Sunday. First Sunday in October each year, churches around the world acknowledge that we are that body together united by the Holy Spirit Trusting that whatever we know and don't know, however we see the world in our everyday lives, that we are together in God's purpose and that He is working things together. So let us take this meal together knowing that God has called us to trust in Him, to follow, 
and to be built up by the Holy Spirit in prayer and in our life together. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, nourish us with these elements. Give us confidence and trust so that doubt may not draw us away from faith, but may draw us closer to You and be an invitation for greater faith in a world where it's difficult to know what is right, what will happen. Lord, we pray for Your guiding hand. Give us the trust to serve. Help our unbelief. Pray these things in Jesus' name.